the national <laughs> the national bureau of economic research from america has pronounced that the corona recession only lasted two months the shortest one ever that means we're in recovery that means we're on our way back but Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners, and I are going to raise the very real possibility that it wasn't a recession, in the same sense that the 2007 to 2009 downturn wasn't a recession either. But first, ladies and gentlemen, if we did have a sponsor, one of the potential sponsors could be the Financial Times, including specifically John Dizard, or is it Dizard? I don't know because I'm confused because on today's report, today's M July 23rd column, he's got a lizard or a lizard. I'm not sure. It's Godzilla. And the reason why it's being sponsoring the show here is because it's called the horror scenario lurking in the plumbing of finance, U.S. Treasury bonds. And it starts out back when Hollywood was fully functional. Horror movies were reliably released around Halloween or sometimes whenever there was a Friday the 13th. This year, though, the horror movie in U.S. Treasuries, the mother of all contemporary markets, is being played out over the summer and early autumn. Where does this story go? Jeff, you might know a little bit. Yeah, first of all, it's Dizard. <laughs> so I know it's... Lizard? This is Godzilla the Lizard? It is. It's Godzilla I'm sorry, the Lizard. Mr. Absolutely. I'm sorry, true. Mr. Dizard. I always mess it up. Oh, go ahead. Well, did you say... You oh, said, first of all... Was, is there a second of all? Should there be a second of all? No, I mean, because we, we, can we can't go. top the lizard, dizer, lizard, dizzard discussion. I mean, that's that's just. Uh, it's cool. The Financial Times is talking about treasury trouble. Read it. Which, today. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's one of those things where you see, you know, I, I, we talk about this before and probably will into the future where it's a small sign of progress. You know, whereas before these kinds of topics were very rarely, if ever, spoken about, now we're seeing more and more interest in the mainstream about what's really going on because we've been shoveled a you know a spoonful, we've been spoon fed all of this crap for so long, and it never seems to work out the way it's supposed to, right? Because the you know, my, the mainstream media was monolithic just a couple years ago about how things were going to inflation, interest rates are going to go higher. And then, you know, it went the exact wrong, opposite way. And eventually some people are going to get tired of being spoon fed all that crap and say, maybe we need to take a look at what really goes on in some of these things. Because just even after a couple seconds of looking at them, you can see we're missing a big part of the equation or it's, it's just it's, it doesn't line up with what we're being told. And when we talk about the Treasury market collateral repo and all these things, going back to September of 2019, suddenly people were reminded about, hey, what repo? I've heard that before, and it seems to be very important. What's going on in repo? And uh, when you start, as I said, you, all, it does, all it takes is just a tiny bit of research, and what you find is there's a hell of a lot more going on here than I was ever, ever told. Well, one institution that we look to for advice for telling us what's happening is the National Bureau of Economic Research. And just the other day, they said the recession was only two months long. And in an article that was titled, The Contraction is Over, which means the hard part only begins, you posted that on the 21st of July at Alhambra Partners. And Jeff, you come to the point that maybe it wasn't even a recession. Do you want to tell us a little or anything about the NBER, about what they do? Yeah, I'm not really sure how they became the official declarer of recession. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the uh, medieval court between, uh, you know, around the, whatever medieval king, where they hand out various titles for that sound like, you know, the keeper of the horse or something like that. I mean, the official declarer or the official arbiter of the business cycle. It sounds like a, you know, it, it's a weird kind of a title, but, and I don't know where the hell these people got it from other than the fact that the NBER is sort of a loose amalgamation of quote unquote top economists. So, you know, it, it stands to reason the public would say, we don't really know much about the economy and how it really works. So maybe these quote unquote economists know what they're talking about. So if they say we're in a recession, who is to argue with them, right? And so if they say the recession's over, who is to argue with them? And so that's kind of how, it, how they, they sort of just absorb this role and say, okay, we're the ones who tell you if we're in a recession or not. And that's yeah. sort of what they've done. 
Yeah, they're self-appointed. And as you said, it's the creme de la creme of economists. I'm not going to read out all the names, but we've got Christina Romer, David Romer, Ben Bernanke used to be here, Martin Feldstein. And this goes... And this goes all the way back to 1978. So I think people might have the sense that this was around quite a big time, a long time. And in contemporary times, they would date the recessions. But no, this only started in 1978. It's the Business Cycle Dating Committee. Everyone is from Stanford or MIT or Berkeley or Harvard or Princeton. So I think that's, you know, they're just self Yeah, the uh, quote and, unquote saltwater economists. There's and one you know, from Chicago. In some ways, it's kind of ridiculous, too, because it's not like they say we're in a recession or we're going to be in a recession next month. We, we're, we're telling you there's a recession coming or the recovery's here. Recession's over as, it's, as it gets to the bottom. Typically, these people wait, as they did now, an entire year to tell you, oh, by the way, there was a recession that began a year ago, as they did in 2008. I mean, that, that one was the one that really, I mean, that, that should have gotten a lot more uh, attention and focus because they didn't say the great quote unquote recession began until December of 2008, when everybody around the world said, uh, no, duh. I remember Thank that. you for telling us this because we need that. you to tell us that we're in a recession right now. And that, and then also, I mean, that's not just a trivial thing. And you know, we're not, we're, you know, it's not, this is not just a cheap shot at the NBER because at that time, you know, they should have said we were in recession earlier because in the middle of 2008 in particular, we've talked about this before, especially with the Federal Reserve, there was the idea that the U.S. economy would somehow avoid a recession entirely due to the very good work of one Ben Bernanke and Bill Dudley, his sidekick, which when we just spent a lot of time talking about, Bill Dudley and the rest of them have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And that kind of goes to why the NBR had to wait until December of 2008 to declare the Great Recession a recession. These people really don't know what they're talking about. They kind of have an idea where, hey, it's December 2008, the world kind of falling apart. Yes, we might have been in a recession. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. We really needed that. At the same so, time. No, no go, go ahead. ahead, sir. No, I was just going to say, so if, if they have that trouble with that much trouble declaring this is a recession, we need we need a Lehman Brothers and AIG and, you know, hundreds of thousands of job losses to tell you that there was a recession. That everybody already knows is, is going on. What about their prowess for saying we're in a recovery? That's right. That's we're going deeper. It's not like we're going to say, well, actually, it lasted four months or three months or something. And then, Jeff, you say in here, it's hard to argue with the logic and the reasons given by almost every account. The economy went straight down, beginning right at the last edge of last February, but truly throughout March and extending all the way into April. Beginning in May, however, the powers of reopening, the economy was back on the mend. So Jeff, we're not going to be saying, uh, yeah, it was three months, four months, five months, we're going to go deeper, we're going to talk about recovery as to whether it even occurred. And that's where you you ask the next question. Well, there's this issue about this whole thing, actually, if, if it had been a recession at all. So what, what are you, where do we go from here, Jeff? Well, we're, let's talk about the business cycle. What mm -hmm. is a business cycle? And that's really, the, from the NBER standpoint, what they're saying is, all we do is we declare sections of a business cycle. We're not telling you whether or not the business cycle has disappeared because we believe or we presume and assume that it hasn't. So what they're saying is that the economy is, has two states. It's a binary choice for them. Either it's in recession or it's in recovery. Those are the only two options that the NBER has. So the the more more important the more important discussion and debate is about whether or not that's the right framework to analyze what's going on, because if we don't have normal business cycles, then there are other options besides recession and recovery. But from the perspective of the NBR, what they you know to give them a little slack here, what they're saying is in their the recent declaration is that the recession part, the contraction part, is over. And what they're not saying is that you know everything is fine and dandy now. What they're saying is that we're on the path to potential recovery, and it could be a long, slow process. In our official declaration, all it really says, if we're really getting technical about it, is if things go wrong and we go back into a recession, if we go into another contraction, that it's another contraction. It's not the same one. 
And again, it's okay. Thanks, thanks, genius. What's <laughs> what's the point of this, right? It's 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 sort of like okay, this is, but you know, this is the academic the academic way of viewing the economy. Really, that there's this idea that there's only two states. We're either in recession or recovery. It's one or the other. So if we're out of recession, we must be in recovery. Even if technically the NBR would say, well, it's not exactly what we said, but it is. See, they have a very nice FAQ, business cycle dating procedure, and they have one here that says, what is a recession? What is an expansion? To your point, there are two states. And they say an expansion is a period when the economy is not in recession. And then here's a key line, Jeff. Expansion is the normal state of the economy. As we often say, we think if it goes below zero, that's bad. That's a contraction. No, it's more bad. It's worse. Uh, if it's the normal state to be in expansion, then if we fall below trend, that's also bad. And Jeff, stay below you, trend, right? It's the nonlinear contraction. Yes. Even though you. GDP is growing, it's growing at an insufficient rate. Therefore, it is a contraction. Even if it, you don't, you don't see a negative sign on the GDP report, it's not growing fast enough, which creates all these other problems. And the example I always give is about uh, microchips and processors and how they're supposed to double in processing power every 18 months or so. And if you go back in time, we're still on that trend. But if we were still growing the processing power, but nowhere near doubling, are we fine? Is it okay? No, we're way off trend. It's a problem, but it's above zero. Same thing with the economy. If we are below trend, but above zero, it's still a problem, especially for a sustained period of time. Yeah, and the, the NBR says that's recovery when we know that recovery, it's not. Exactly. There's, it's, it's, there's more diverse options here than just one or the other. And where does that, where does that presumption come from? It comes from a specific time period in modern history between World War II and 2007. Because during that period, it really seemed like that's only to, the only two options, it's not just the U.S. economy, but many developed economies around the world. In fact, I think all of the developed economies around the world followed that same pattern. It was either recession or recovery. And there was nothing other, nothing other between that. But immediately you got to ask yourself, okay, but what was it that made that period in history? Was it that period in history representative of all history going forward? Or maybe was that a unique period in history where that 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 kind of um, that kind of pattern dominated because of specific factors that may no longer apply? And what economists say is, no, we just assume that this is the way it's always going to be. When that's you're already you, that's a, just a dangerous assumption because you know the world doesn't follow such rules. And think about what it was before the World War II. Um, these non-recovery recoveries were fairly common. So what, you know, what was it that explains how we got into this different kind of recession pattern versus what it had been before? And why do we believe that that would be permanent? And that's where you get into some of the more trivial stuff and things that will kind of blow your mind. Bef as you said, before World War II, this was accepted. And here I've got a book, Anatomy of a Bear by uh, Mr. Russell Napier. And what did he do? He went back to... Uh, the four great bottoms of the U.S. stock market, and he read newspapers around that bottom to try to get a sense. Can you figure out what were people thinking? What were the conditions? How would you know that this is the bottom? And so he went back to 1921, 1932, 64, 68, forgive me, 82. Anyways, and in this book, he pulls the quotes from the Wall Street Journal at the time. And Jeff, here, I'm reading July 27th, 1921. They had no problem, no problem using the D word. When the crops are on their way to the market and when certain important financing is completed, then perhaps the public will begin to recognize that improvement has begun and that depression is ending. And Jeff, you know what I was finding remarkable when I was reading this book? They use that D word all the time. They're so profane. Assurance is now doubly sure. This is August 1st, 
1921, that we have reached the bottom of the business depression. Continuing on, October 2nd, the trough of the business depression has very clearly passed. October 5th, 1921, it is well to say that there is nothing in our domestic situation nor in the international situation that can sustain a pessimistic outlook or a despondent view that the world has sunk into permanent depression. October 5th, 1921, Wall Street Journal. From observations, I am firmly convinced that the bottom of business depression has been reached over and over. They're not afraid to use it. Of course, in the 1930s, no problem as well. But now, that word isn't even considered in our present circumstances. And then I think, you know, economists would say, you know, what they would argue is that it's sort of a semantical argument, but it's not. There's, there's a legitimate basis here for questioning these assumptions, which is, you know, Milton Friedman's plucking model, I think, described it best, even though, you know, most economists wouldn't say they use it. But it, it's conceptually, I think it, it really really defines what we're talking about here, which is that recession does not alter the long run trajectory of the economy. It is merely a temporary, very short temporary deviation from that permanent trend. And what we saw after 2008 was not that, not that at all. And I mean, completely different, something entirely new that we hadn't seen since the 1930s. And just looking at this chart, you're thinking, the last time we saw something like this was the 1930s. So maybe that assumption that the recession recovery dynamic that describes described by the MBR, maybe that was just a narrow, unique case in history. And we should consider that there are other possible alternatives, especially when we start to re start to investigate what is it that economists assume happened during that 1940 to 19 or 1940 to 2007 window. What accounts for this idea that 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 um, economic potential is never disturbed by contraction, or as they you know what they the, there's no unit roots possible. We we don't allow permanent shocks because it was never in the post-war period. And what they come up with is that we don't really know. They don't really know why. There's all the you know there's lots of different theories. Among them is that central banks have become really good at their job which is obviously not what happened in 2008 so the very idea that there's only recession or recovery i mean you're staring at evidence that that can't be true i've pulled up a graph your graph from the article we were discussing and it shows real gdp in the united states of america going back to 2005 but you've got a nice big blue dash line jeff that says this was the estimate by the cbo what is that congressional budget office right and before so in january this, 2007 they looked ahead 10 years and said yeah. What is the economic potential that we don't believe will ever be deviated from? So even if we have a recession, what we expect is that GDP will decline and then go right back to that dotted line, which is recovery. So defining our terms even more, recession is the downward trend away from the dotted line. Recovery is re, re, uh, reattaching to the dotted line. But we and didn't get that. No, this is a damning chart, Jeff, but even more damning and truly... I don't know, despicable, heartbreaking. To me, is it's the corrupt. next chart corrupt. Yeah. Look to at me, this, it's, it's ladies a, it's and a gentlemen. It's a measure of corruption. I don't mean corruption in the fact that they're stealing money. It's cor it's intellectual corruption. What are because we, what they're what are saying we here is the CBO said, well, we expect recovery in 2007. Well, you know, then we go fast forward to 2011 when re GDP and output and economic growth were not seemingly going in the recovery fashion. So they started to think, well, maybe there's something wrong with the economy. So maybe it was that whatever happened lowered economic potential. And so over the decade afterward, as, as economic growth did not boom, as the economy did not recover ever, what economists did was said, well, it must be that the economy itself is broken. Americans are too lazy. They won't go back to work. They won't go back to school. They're retiring. Any number of things to avoid having to say, we screwed up big here. And we, I don't just mean the NBER not admitting that this wasn't a recovery, but more so look at when all of this stuff started to happen. Where was that big deviation? 
in 2007 and 2008. What happened in 2007 and 2008 that could possibly explain all this? Maybe a massive global monetary crisis that's never been fixed. And so by writing down potential, they're really violating their own presumptions to begin with and doing so in a very, as you said, very insidious way to avoid having to say, we screwed this up in every possible way fashion. Not only that, we're hiding the results so that we can say the, oh, this is recovery. Look, GDP is matching its potential. What they don't tell you is that they wrote down that potential on the order of something like six, five and six trillion dollars a year. Five and six trillion dollars a year, I submit to the audience here, would have would have forestalled a lot of the political and social consequences that we see around them. Imagine five trillion more in GDP a year. What that would have done, millennials no longer stuck in their parents' base. I mean, complaining about student loan debt. The amount of opportunity and economic uh, sufficiency in that $5 trillion we don't even know is missing is so mind-bogglingly huge that it's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible that it's, a, it's, it's actually happened. But Going... recession or recovery, right? That's the only two options we have. And if, if we don't have a recovery, then we'll just, we'll just create one out of thin air. At the end of their FAQ, the NBER does address this topic, and I commend them for that question. Does the committee identify depressions as well as recessions in its chronology? Answer, the NBER does not separately identify depressions in its business cycle chronology. The term depression is often used to refer to a particularly severe period of economic weakness. Weakness, not contraction. <laughs> no, this exactly. is weakness. It doesn't Weakness. I think that's where you want to go with this, right, Emil? Let's yeah. define another term here. Recession and recovery. I agree a recovery is, is what they think it is, which is where we have a, we have a contraction and then the economy within a short, real, relatively short period of time or a relatively reasonable period of time, let's call it that, in a reasonable period of time goes back to an unaltered trend or potential. That is a recovery. They agree. The NBER, the more common use in term, they're referring to depression again, also encompasses the time until economic activity has returned to normal levels, not the level where it was, but just the graph we were looking at. The normal levels is up because economic expansion is positive usually. So they're saying depression is economic weakness for a prolonged yeah, period until we return to normal levels that dash we need line. to say in our definition is that look if you have to reduce economic potential so that you can avoid admitting what the nbr just said that is a definitive signal that that, that this is wrong it was never recovery what the nbr is or what economists would argue is that the economy after 2007 2008 recovered because it's back to its potential now, it, did, it took it till 2017 and 18 to do it, but it did. Yeah. When No, if you have to reduce potential that severely just to avoid having to, having to just to preserve this recession recovery binary, no, there's, there must be other options available. And the other option is that we experienced a permanent shock, which clearly correlates, and not just in this GDP versus potential data, but then I mean, just think about things like the bond market. It all correlates to a single cause and effect, which is monetary system, global euro dollar. I like referring to it as the silent depression, not because the people in the government offices don't say anything. I understand why they wouldn't, because they promise, as we've discussed before, the professional economists in positions of power over the public servants, they promise we would never let this happen again. Bernanke, you know, we're not going to let a depression happen again. But it's silent because the media doesn't bring it up. And Jeff, it's the, if, I mean, it's the story of all stories, isn't it? If, not just what you said. I mean, what you said is absolutely true. Ben yes. Bernanke said we'd never let it happen again. But also think about the uh, the accolades that he's earned since it did happen what he said was that we prevented a depression from, or de we prevented the great recession from becoming something worse well, what would something worse than the great recession be the great recession was a temporary contraction worse than a temporary contraction 
is we come out the other side with something very, very different than we went into it with. So his whole reputation has been built on the idea that we prevented, quote unquote, going into a depression when by the NBER's own definitions, that's exactly what has taken place since then. And bringing this forward to 2020, 2021, what are we looking at now? We're looking at the potential, especially after yesterday's GDP report that didn't accelerate as planned, of repeating a permanent shock. And what does that mean? Well, we'll probably have to save that for a future episode, but we already have an idea as we've been talking about in the labor market with a participation rate falling yet again for, oh, it must be a labor shortage. It must be, I mean, any number of excuses that are being written out. And I'd wager that over time, when we look at the CBOE potential numbers, they're probably going to be doing a lot of downgrading and, and revising lower over the years of head to avoid having to say that there's anything that there's other possibilities besides recovery. In 1969, Murray Rothbard, I like we're using this quote often, said that economists, the best way to avoid a depression is to simply write it out of existence. <laughs> quote, yeah. After the disaster of 1929, economists and politicians resolved that this must never happen again. The easiest way of succeeding at this resolve was simply to define depressions out of existence. Jeff, the Financial Times, November 2019. Latin America faces a second lost decade. The Economist, December 14, 2019. Latin America's second lost decade is not as bad as the first. Foreign Affairs, Latin America's lost decades. That's January and February 2021. Here we go to The Economist again. They're talking about Brazil. It's from June 5th of this year. The result was Brazil's worst ever recession. The D word, Jeff, you dare not say it. It's true. And, you know, it's true. I, I, I'm advised all the time not to use that word because it, preve it, it, it prevents honest discussion and analysis from people who don't accept it, who believe that the, the mainstream NBR view that their depressions are impossible. And so by using, even using the word, you're sort of turning off a large portion of the population who don't want to even consider these possibilities because for various reasons. And it's funny you bring up the Latin America's lost decade. Maybe that's another way of saying depression, right? That's the point. Yeah, exactly. That's secular yeah, we stagnation, can admit it for Latin America, Japan, normal. whatever. No, they can't even admit it for Latin America. They call it a lost decade. They call it a new normal, a secular stagnation. Right. They can't even admit it, even though it's a decade. What is but that? Going back to what we said before, they can say these things and come up with all their euphemisms they want after the fact when we were writing in 2013 and 2014 that this was coming. I, t I wrote in late 2013 that Brazil was toast before anybody even considered, before even the real real crisis hit Brazil. I told you that what they were doing was going to lead to the worst economic, Brazil was toast. In fact, I think that was the title of my article. It, that's the kind of the point we're trying to make here. They don't have any useful information ahead of time or in arrears because they're looking at everything in the exact wrong way. It's another continuation of the intellectual corruption that starts with what we talked about in the earlier segments, which is we're not supposed to even consider the monetary system as a, as a, as a useful factor in analysis at all, when everything, and I mean everything around the world, continues to point at only the monetary system that explains what's actually going on. And that includes the idea that there's more than just recession or recovery as you pointed out, we live in a nonlinear world. Yes, GDP is going up, but if it's not going up at a, quite, a fast rate, that is still contraction. And here we are in 2021, still have never recovered from 2008. That's, it's, it's just, and I think it's too much for many people to just absorb and, and understand and, and accept without being beaten over the head with it. Well, I will gladly just point them to the NBER, which says it themselves. It's a period of ec weak economic growth or expansion, and for until we get back to normal. That sounds. That's what that, I mean, I was, is it even uh, expansion? Yes, GDP no, is didn't. up in absolute. Yeah, no. Is that even an expansion, though? You mm -hmm. know, it's, and I, that's part. You know, we have we use these imprecise terms: recession, recovery. That we kind of use them loosely for 
any number of things. Re uh, let's see. A term depression is often used to refer to a particularly severe period of economic weakness. Bingo. Thank you. Jeff, if so I was the weasel word severe, <laughs> is that what they well, would say? Well, see, it's, oh, it's weakness mm -hmm. and it's prolonged, but is it severe enough? I mean, oh, good point. Yeah, I didn't yeah, catch so that. I mean, that's, you know, to, to what good, our just yeah, what's good. germane to our discussion here is that doesn't actually matter. It, severe. Yeah, I would argue that this is obviously severe because of what we're seeing, time. not just in markets, but all over the world and time. Yes. Time, yeah. I mean, we're talking about more than a decade. It lost decades is not a good thing. I'm going to ask David Parkins, our illustrator, to do something with frying pan and fire. So like the NBR is saying, hey, we're out of the fi frying pan. That's, Jeff? That's, a, that's a good analogy, right? That's why you know, the title of this article was, you know, the hard part begins. And the hard part is, OK, we can all agree there was a contraction, right? That was easy. The entire world knew there was a contraction, just like we didn't need the NBR to tell us there was a contraction in 2008. We knew it. But the hard part is we don't know, and I'm talking about the public in general, we don't know what follows it. We assume, we're told to assume it's a recovery, but we can't really get our heads. I mean, it's not easy for everyone to say this is a recovery. And that itself is a sign because it's been a long time now, but you go back to periods of legitimate economic growth. If you're old enough and remember what the economy was like, it was like a recession. Everybody knew it was a recovery. Everybody knew it was an illegitimate expansion. There was no debate. There no, was no argument. It was unambiguous. And so that we're even discussing it as a possibility is already is we're, we're in the wrong we're in the wrong position to begin with. And it's really are we taught what this is the hard part. We have to get people to realize that, yeah, we can call it recovery because it's no longer recession, but that doesn't mean it's an actual recovery. There are other options and really it doesn't take long to find them because we just went through the same thing. Talk to you again next week, Jeff. All right. Take care, Emil.